Good evening. Good evening, one and all. Great to see you all here tonight. To the Honourable John Howard, the Honourable Dr Nelson and his wife Gillian, the President of the New South Wales Legislative Council, the Honourable Matthew Mason Cox, Federal Party President, the Honourable John Olson, State Party President, the Honourable Philip Ruddock, many former ministers and members, including Michael Bohm, Gary Nan and Charlie Lynn. Deputy Federal Director of the Liberal Party, Simon Berger. Many Liberal organisational leaders past and present, including Mary Lou Jarvis, Rhonda Van Zeller and Carl Morris. Menzies Research Centre Chairman Paul Espy, MRC Board Members Mitch Hook and Brian Lochnane and former Board Member Tony McClellan. Councillors, captains of industry, community leaders, leaders in academia, authors, my MRC colleagues, uh, friends, one and all. It is a delight and an honour to welcome you to this, the ninth John Howard Lecture, in person. My name's Tim James. I'm the Executive General Manager of the Menzies Research Centre. This is our final event in what has been an extraordinary year. And I say that, of course, with a slight sense of deja vu, for it was not dissimilar last year. And indeed, as with last year, for many months we hoped that this lecture could and would be delivered in person, and we are so, so happy to be here with you all tonight. We kept last year's lecture, we had to, to about 50 people in person, and isn't it terrific to be among about 250 people here tonight? And let us hope that next year's 10th lecture will be one among 500 or even 1,000 people. So we've saved the best until last in 2021, and tonight we will certainly finish the year on a great high note. We're not broadcasting this event live, however, it is being recorded, so please do help us to ensure there is atmosphere and audience engagement. I said this time last year, please don't be on mute. Uh, we do have, my friends, a special MRC book offer outside, so please have a good look uh, afterwards, uh, and you can get signed copies of books about or by our greatest living Liberal, John Howard. In a moment, Nick Cater will introduce Brendan Nelson. We have then a special video presentation to be played. Mr Howard will later offer an extended vote of thanks to Brendan Nelson. If you need anything during the evening, please let me or any of the Menzies team know. Otherwise, please sit back, uh, relax, rejoice in the fact that we're here in person, and once again, please don't be on mute. Thanks so much and enjoy this evening. Thank you.
Doctor, I'm Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre, the custodians of the John Howard Lecture. I have the pleasurable duty of convening this gathering once a year, come rain, hail or COVID, and uh, it's an occasion, of course, upon which we can honour the service of our greatest living Prime Minister, a man who led his party in opposition government for 16 years and stands on the podium next to Sir Robert Menzies in the pantheon of Prime Ministerial longevity. His uh, service to the party has continued in the 14 years since he left office, including as a tireless supporter of the Menzies Research Centre and a wise counsellor to many, including myself. Will you all join me, please, in honouring our 25th Prime Minister, the Honourable John Howard. <laughs> Successful leaders, of course, are team builders, people with the knack of discovering talent in the most unlikely places. In this, Mr Howard was a master. Before Mr Howard, no Prime Minister, not even the great Robert Menzies, had discovered ministerial talent in a member for Bradfield. <laughs> now, that was before our speaker tonight was elected to the North Shore seat at the relatively young age of 38, having already made a considerable contribution to public life. Dr. Brendan Nelson is the son of a trade unionist who trained as a doctor and became federal president of the Australian Medical Association, some would say following in his father's footsteps. At the age of 34, he became a, a national figure for his advocacy of gay law reform, environmental stewardship, and improving the welfare of Aboriginal people, particularly in remote and regional communities. He stood for Parliament in 1996 and was duly elected as the member for Bradfield. In 2001, in his third term of government, Mr Howe promoted Brendan Nelson to Cabinet as the Minister for Education, Science and Training, and his achievements in that portfolio are recognised widely amongst those who've held it since, including the current Education Minister and those in the sector. In 2006, Dr Nelson was appointed Minister of Defence, and in 2007, he succeeded Mr Howard as leader of the Liberal Party. His departure from Parliament in 2009 was far from the end of his public life. He was appointed Ambassador to Belgium, Luxembourg and the European Union and NATO, and he was appointed Director of the Australian War Memorial in, 1920, in, sorry, in 2012. He's uh, currently Chair of Boeing Australia and Chair of the American Chamber of Commerce and sits on a number of boards of philanthropic organisations. Please join me in honouring a life of outstanding public service and a man of great honour, integrity and intelligence. The ninth John Howard Lecturer, Dr Brendan Nelson. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Nick, for your very generous introduction and your leadership of the Men's Research Centre. Uh, the Honourable John Howard, OMAC. Uh, what a magnificent but edited tribute uh, that we've just seen. And I thank you for the honour of being able to deliver this, the ninth uh, John Howard lecture here this evening. Uh, the Honourable John Olson AO, the President of the Liberal Party of Australia, uh, the Honourable Philip Ruddick AO, President of the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party, Paul Espy, the Chair of the Menzies Research Centre, and uh, I'd, I'd also like to recognise uh, Rhonda Vanzella, without whom I would not have ever have been the member for Bradfield. Um, <laughs> And there are others here, uh, amongst them Simon Berger, whom you heard uh, mentioned, uh, Margaret Jack, uh, my dear friend, uh, Doug Thompson, and many others who are not household names, but to whom I owe an immense debt. I'd also like to recognise my wife, uh, Gillian, Lady Nelson. In fact, uh, we're... in fact, when I had arrived in Brussels and I had all of the embassy staff together on my 
uh, first day setting out the vision for our relationship with NATO and the European Union and uh, over 50 of the staff and they're, they're very serious people in DFAT, they're all sitting forward taking notes and and I, I got to, a, I said this is a very serious issue, it's my wife, I've heard some of you referring to her as Gillian and some of you have called her Ms Adamson, I've heard people call her Mrs Nelson, uh, I said but on the continent she's Lady Nelson. <laughs> Several days later, Gillian says to me at the residence, she said, they're very nice people in there at the embassy, but gee, they're formal. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here this evening. Uh, in spite of the fact that I'm a speaker, it, it means a great deal to me. And uh, I recognise the Gadigal clan of the Aura people, the traditional uh, Aboriginal custodians of the land where we meet. And I also recognise that we meet very close to Christmas where Christians will celebrate the birth of Christ and in it a renewal of optimism, hope and a recommitment to the ideals of mankind. Irrespective of one's faith, it is Christmas. I've done something uh, a bit unusual this evening. I've actually written a speech and uh, I've written it before I've given it. So. Uh, uh, those who've worked with me will tell you that's very unusual, but uh, such is the respect I have for Mr Howard that I have done so. The John Howard lecture and the privilege bestowed on me in delivering it is in the end about leadership. Although an entire industry is dedicated to the task, in my experience leadership is not something that can be taught, but it can be learned. You don't realise what you're learning when you're learning it. The qualities that inform leadership can be revealed through observation of, reflection upon and absorption of the leadership qualities that we see in others. And the power is in the story. At the groundbreaking of the Robert Frost Library at Amherst College in October 1963, President John F. Kennedy, 35th President of the United States of America, observed that a nation reveals itself not only by those whom it chooses to lead, but those whom it chooses to honour. So too for a political movement. We gather here to honour John Howard, Australia's second longest serving Prime Minister, chosen to lead our party on three occasions. His, consecutive convic his conservative convictions lifted the Menzian vision, encompassing and respecting the philosophical legacies of both Edmund Burke and John Stuart Mill, passing them to the next generation of Liberals. The principal motivation for John Howard's political life was reform, ideas to challenge orthodoxy, to inspire and create the future worthy of and needed by the next generation. Some lead from position. Leader of the party, chairman of the board, captain of the team. Others eschew position to pursue principle. William Wilberforce's crusade against slavery, offering perhaps history's most compelling illustration. Exceptional leaders do both. John Howard led from both position and principle. He used the position given him by the Liberal Party and our nation to turn conviction into policy for the advancement of Australia. Politics with purpose. He changed the Liberal Party and remarkably in the 1980s, he also, from opposition, changed the Labor Party. Australians all let us rejoice, for we are one and free. We sing it often, we hear it sung often, but far less often do we pause to reflect on what that really means. The first line of our national anthem. And therein lies the great paradox. It's often those things that are most important to us in our lives, human beings that we are, we have a tendency to take for granted. The magic and vitality of your youth, you don't fully appreciate until it's gone, forever. Our physical good health and emotional resilience, the families who love us, 
give meaning and context and architecture to our lives. Our Australian citizenship, whether conferred by birth or by choice, affording us as Australians political, economic and religious freedoms, to live as we do in a society where faith coexists with reason, free academic inquiry, an independent judiciary and a free press. These and more, our generation, my generation, have assumed and we can no longer afford to do so. We seldom ask ourselves what is it that makes us Australian, but we should. Essential, of course, though they are, it's not our constitution nor the machinery of a democracy given us by the British. We are defined instead by our values and our beliefs, the way we relate to one another and see our place in the world. We are defined as a people by our triumphs and our failures, the way that we have been shaped by adversity, how we will respond to the inevitable adversities that are coming and respond also to new, emerging and increasingly threatening horizons. We're also defined by our heroes, those whom we choose to honour and also our villains. The pace and scale of change in our world is immense. It's possible that as occurred over four decades, in the late 15th century, humankind is moving to a new age and we are living through it. As described by Yale's Professor Paul Kennedy, though free of the world-changing cataclysms of Napoleonic Wars or the Second World War, the transformation through which we are living is profound. We are living through the most consequential geopolitical realignment in our lifetime. The institutions that were built following the Second World War that have underwritten the global order through our lifetime are being severely tested. Some of its key instruments are failing the world that is, let alone the one that's coming. The democracies of the Anglosphere are increasingly fractious and polarised. Significant minorities, significant, cynical and disillusioned, are driving a re-emergent counterculture. Humankind faces the existential environmental challenge of a changing climate. A once in a century global pandemic, far from over and in which power has concentrated in the hands of health officials and medical science. We face immense global economic uncertainty with pandemic induced disruption to global output, consumption, liquidity and supply chains with necessarily growing debt and the need for foreign investment, Australia will rely even more on its most important strategic economic partner, the United States of America and its deep and wide capital markets. So too, vast technological change, along with exponentially expanding space exploration and its militarisation. Sino-American rivalry is taking us into a world that we have not lived in since the Franco-Prussian War or the Qing Dynasty. In all of this, what is most important is that we be clear about who we are, in what it is we believe and the truths by which we live. What is it that we believe worth fighting for? diplomatically, politically, and perhaps even militarily. The great British historian Kenneth Clarke, in his groundbreaking, towering television series, Civilization, which was broadcast in the late 1960s on the ABC, BBC, studied civilization from inception to the 20th century. And in the final episode, he concluded, no matter how complex it may be, society is fragile. It is lack of confidence, he said, more than anything else that destroys a civilization. 
We can destroy ourselves with cynicism and disillusionment, he said, just as effectively as by bombs. It's vision, more than anything else, that differentiates leadership from management. A comprehensive sense of who we are, where we want to go, why, and what we will need to do to get there. Neither Robert Menzies nor John Howard ever allowed members of the Liberal Party to forget what it is in which we believe, what binds us and the constant need to look to the future. There are five key priorities, in my opinion, that are before us. The first is prosperity, the standard of living that we create and leave for the next generation. Hard though it may be, much needed reform still lies ahead in productivity, education, workplace relations, taxation, research and development. The Federation that served us so well for much of the 20th century, its three tiers of government and division of responsibilities clearly needs re-examination for the new, rapidly emerging world. When Henry Parks rose to deliver the Tenterfield oration, just over a decade before Federation, neither he nor those who devised our Constitution could possibly have envisaged the world in which we now live. As hard as it is, as impossible perhaps, could we at not least begin the long journey to modernising our Federation and its myriad layers of disparate responsibilities, rules and regulations, often overlapping and in conflict with one another? The environment. It is long past time for us to live on environmental interest and not capital. Committed completely to a sustainable future. We must make our proportionate, responsible contribution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, leading and supporting Australians through what is for many a painful but inevitable transition. The defence of our nation, its people, interests and values, the rapid continuing modernisation of our military capabilities accelerated by increasing technology transfer from our key ally uh, under AUKUS, as recently negotiated and announced. And fifthly, the cohesion of our society, wherein perhaps, as Kenneth Clark concluded, lies our greatest challenge. The great 19th century English philosopher and thinker on classical liberalism, to whom John Howard referred to more than a few times throughout his own political career, he concluded that two essential preconditions for a nation to exist and sustained must be adhered. The first, he said, was that people should want to be governed as one people, as a single nation, and our forebears resolved to do so, the legal architecture for federation taking effect in 1901. The second precondition identified by Mill was that people must be bound what he described by a common fellow feeling, one he said deeply rooted in language, literature and history. No place served to remind us more of who gave us what we have, made us who we are, than the Australian War Memorial. The late and great US Senator John McCain visited the memorial in May 2017. A one hour visit turned into two hours. We stood before the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier. I told him, not a day goes by in this country where publicly or privately we do not give thanks for American sacrifice in the Pacific from December 1941 to the end of the war. 300,000 American casualties, 103,000 dead, 
half those bodies never found. We walked from the Hall of Memory, slowly, past the bronze panels, the names of 41,000 Australians killed, fighting with the United States in Europe, the Pacific, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan. And then we stopped at the parapet of the memorial. And gesturing down Anzac Parade toward the parliament, I said, Senator McCain, in that building, exercised and defended on our behalf are our political, economic and religious freedoms. But here, we reveal our character. We reveal our character as a people. Unlike until you come here, I said to him, it's not possible to fully understand us, what makes us tick, and why we are an ally of the United States and we're not just good friends. The values informing our national character, I said to him, are found here. Our values are our interests. And he turned to me and said, and our interests are our values. The past is essential. It's vital to any understanding of the future. When little else makes sense, history is the guiding discipline. It leads to new horizons, it overcomes fear, and it can also inspire. Of the two million objects, artefacts in the Australian War Memorials collection, five in my opinion, speak most powerfully to our values. The first is the bullet-ridden Gallipoli landing boat from the transport ship Ascot. It took men of the 13th Battalion ashore on the day of the Gallipoli landings. A short distance from it is a painting by George Lambert, a painting of men, soldiers, falling as if marionettes having had their strings cut. It depicts the charge of the Australian light horse at the neck in the northern part of the Anzac sector in August 1915. At 4.30 in the morning, on the 7th of August 1915, four waves of dismounted light horse, 150 in each wave, would attack the Turks. Only 20 to 60 metres away, the first two waves were the 8th Light Horse from Victoria, the 3rd and 4th, the 10th Light Horse, the Western Australians. The commanding officer of the 8th Light Horse was a man called Alexander Henry White, a 33-year-old maltster, a beer maker from Ballarat. He loved the men of the 8th and he volunteered to lead them. Philip Schuller was the correspondent for the Melbourne Age who observed and reported and recorded what he saw and what happened. And Schuller said that White shook hands with his fellow officers. He stood down in the trench on the fire step. The artillery bombardment of the Turkish lines had finished early and much of it had gone over them. And then with his watch in hand, as the Turks in the eerie silence tested machine guns and rifles, he said, men, you have 10 minutes to live and I will lead you. Schuller said that when the whistle blew, they all went over, every one of them, and White advanced at only 10 paces before he fell. Of the 300 officers and men under White's command in those first two waves, 153 died with him. The 10th Light Horse from Western Australia filed into the trench over the dead, the dying and the wounded, having tried unsuccessfully to stop the attack progressing, by which time the Turks were calling out, don't come, don't come. Trooper Harold Rush famously embraced the man next to him, said goodbye, God bless you, Cobber, which became the epitaph for his headstone. Then he and that man held hands on the parapet and said a prayer. Men removed their wedding rings, wrote final notes, pinned them to the inside of the trench. And when the whistle blew, they all went. And then in the fourth wave, 
the official historian Charles Beat described Gresley Harper running to his death as if a schoolboy in a foot race. At the end of the war, Charles Bean, the official correspondent, historian, decided not to come back to Australia immediately. Instead, he went back to Gallipoli and he took a historical party with him, including George Lambert. And he found the Ascot landing boat on the beach and said it would come back to Australia for the Australian war memorial he was determined would be built. And when they arrived at Lone Pine and the Neck, he described the area as resembling that of scattered thin white snow. So thickly clustered, he said, were the bones. It wasn't possible to pass without treading upon them. Around Alexander Henry White's skeletal remains were found two things he took to his death, clearly important to him. The first was a gold locket on a chain within which was a photograph of his wife, Myrtle, and his infant son, whom he called Young Bill. The second was a Bible. And within that Bible was a newspaper cutting, a poem. Let me be a little braver when temptation bids me waver. Let me strive a little harder to be all that I can be. Let me be a little meeker with the brother that is weaker. Let me think more of my neighbour and a little less of me. The second artefact is a nurse's uniform. Once white, now it's a pale shade of grey. It's fitted to a mannequin in the World War II galleries at the Australian War Memorial. There's a small hole, a bullet hole, in the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. The uniform belonged to a nurse, Vivian Bullwinkle, one of only 22 nurses to survive the massacre on Raji Beach, Banker Island, on the 16th of February, 1942. Wounded, she survived by feigning death in the blood-stained water. Having survived the sinking of the overloaded SS Viner Brook the day before, she and 21 nurses were on Raji Beach on the morning of the 16th, caring for 50 men. 20 Japanese soldiers arrived, bayonets fixed, and marched the men along the beach around a bluff. And as they did, one of the nurses, matron Irene Drummond, said to the others, where there is life, there is hope. The soldiers bayoneted and shot the men. They returned to the nurses, set two machine guns up on the beach and gestured for the nurses to go into the water. Florence Cosson had a fractured femur from the sinking of the ship, so Irene Drummond and another nurse helped her to the water's edge. Bullwinkle said there was no panic, no hysteria. All they did was call the names of those whom they loved. And shortly before she, Cosson and the other nurse were machine gunned, Irene Drummond said, chins up girls, I'm proud of you, I love you all. In life, she offered them hope. In death, she offered them love. The third artefact is G for George the four-engine Lancaster bomber. 10,000 young Australians, average age 24, served in Bomber Command. 3,486 dead. That aircraft remarkably survived 89 missions, returning twice on two engines, engine failure on takeoff on one occasion with a full bomb load. On the 23rd of August 1943, 56 bombers were shot down over Berlin. One was a four-engine Halifax bomber from 158 Squadron. The pilot was a 21-year-old Australian, Kevin Hornibrook. A German night fighter got them just after they left the bomb site. With the aircraft in a death dive, 
the two Australian gunners, 20 and 21, dead. Three of the crew had bailed out. There was only one other man left in the plane, the bomb aimer, a Yorkshireman called Alan Bright. And Alan Bright said that against immense gravitational forces, Kevin Hornibrook got to the forward hatch and forced it open. And he said, Kevin never got out. We'd been too low. My life hinged on that moment when Kevin pushed me out. When my son was born in 1951, I called him Kevin to remind me every single day of Kevin Hornibrook, to whom I owed the rest of my life. Never a day goes by without me remembering that he was first at the door and could easily have saved himself, but he saved me. In 2017, for the 75th anniversary of the Royal Australian Air Force going into Bomber Command formally, we conducted a major event at the Australian War Memorial. We had 37 Bomber Command veterans come. A week before the event, I received a phone call from a woman in Albany, at Western Australia. She said her father, 95 as he was, was a veteran of Bomber Command and would it be possible for him to get in the aircraft when he came to the memorial, the Lancaster? I wasn't sure. I found out and I was told it was. So on the Friday morning before the weekend activities, we'd set up for the media to come and cover him visiting the aircraft, which he had flown once on a mission. Murray Maxton had flown 30 missions in Bomber Command as a pilot. And there he was sitting in the aircraft on a bulkhead. You'd never complain about flying economy to London again, by the way. <laughs> he was wearing his suit, extensive array of medals, and my staff and his daughter had decided it was too dangerous for him to get over the spa in the centre of the aircraft to get to the cockpit where he so desperately wanted to be. And I looked at him and I said, Murray, would I be thinking, if you fell over and broke your neck and died, getting over that spa, you'd die a happy man? And he said, yep. And I said, okay, mate, we're gonna do it. He spent 15 minutes in the cockpit of that aircraft the media filming and photographing from the mezzanine level. And then outside the aircraft beside it, he held a captivating press conference to a very, very large media contingent. And then silence fell on the entire gathering when a young journalist from the ABC asked, well, that all sounds very interesting, Mr Maxton, but how did you feel about the civilians that were killed? He replied by saying, I was in London during the Blitz. We'd heard rumours about what they were doing to the Jews. And then he gestured to the bomber behind him. He said, for a period of time, the only way we had of getting to Hitler was in these aircraft. He said, you've never been in total war. I hope you never are. But I'll give you some advice. You don't want to come second. The fourth relic is the Long Tan Cross. On the 18th of August, 1966, D Company 6 RAR fought an overwhelming force of Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army, and they prevailed. 17 Australians were killed in that rubber plantation, and 18th would die of his wounds. Alan Rankin was the platoon sergeant that day from 10 platoon. And three years later, in 1969, he was in Vietnam again. The decision had been made to construct and place a cross behind enemy lines at Long Tan. And Alan Rankin was tasked with deciding where the cross would be placed. And he told us in 2013, he said, I looked for the 11 platoon position under the command of Gordon Sharp and Bob Buick. They had the first and second contacts, taking 50, 50 cal machine gun fire at ground level. Of the 28 men in 11 platoon at Long Tan, 13 were killed, eight were wounded. 
And Alan said, with the heel of my boot, I marked the spot where the cross was to be erected. I knew it was the blood of that platoon. When people look at that long tan cross, I want them to know that it stood in blood-soaked earth where so many young men paid the ultimate price for what they believe. The fifth object is the cowling from a US Black Hawk helicopter. In 2010, in Kandahar, a US Black Hawk helicopter crashed in a Special Forces insertion operation. Three Australian commandos were killed. Tim Applin, Ben Chuck, and Scott Palmer. On the 6th of August 2013, after formalities for the opening of the Afghanistan exhibition, I was standing in front of the cowling with Mrs Pam Palmer. It had been used as a stretcher to bring out our dead, including her son. She wrapped her arms around me, buried her face in my shoulder, and wept uncontrollably and said, thank you for making my son's life mean something and his memory live. To the dawn service the following April at the memorial, Royal Australian Air Force nurse, Wing Commander Sharon Bowne, who led a surgical team in Afghanistan, concluded her reflections by saying, I have worn their blood. So many of us have worn their blood. Everyone is regarded as being equal at the Australian War Memorial, in death especially. No rank, no military honours, no race, no religion, and no party politics. But within that framework of equality is accorded a special place for the first Australians. Just four or five generations after the first fleet arrived, with everything that they endured, in 1914, they denied their Aboriginality, denied family, denied kinship, from a desperately unequal Australia to volunteer, serve, fight, suffer and die for the young country that had taken so much from them. A Torres Strait Islander of Mabiang Island, Private Charles Meany, served with the 2nd 33rd Battalion in the Second World War. He fought through the gripping battles at Syria, Kokoda, Gona, Shaggy Ridge, Balak Papan. And on the 1st of June 1944, from New Guinea where he was fighting, he was interviewed by the Australian Tribune newspaper. And he said this, I know I am fighting for a new world in which my people will get a better deal. I want to come back to an Australia where my people will have full rights as citizens, to an Australia where Aboriginal children will have the right to education, to work and to a healthy, happy life. Charles Manny served in the Australian Army for 22 years. World War II, the British and Commonwealth Occupational Forces in Japan, he fought with one RAR in Korea, awarded the Military Medal for Bravery, and then went on to the Malayan Emergency. Through those entire 22 years, nothing changed. Not a thing. Late in 2017, I was laying on my stomach, cleaning the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier. Alone with my thoughts in the early morning light, I looked from the tomb down Anzac Parade to the lake and the parliament beyond. Reflecting on the vista and the man buried beneath me who'd given his life for what it represented, I pondered an Australia that he would now not recognise. The most significant thoughts that challenge and transform your outlook often come in random moments of quiet revelation when you least expect. And I got an idea. 
That man-made vista is the most powerfully symbolic our nation has to offer. From the Australian War Memorial, Anzac Parade, lined with memorials honouring our most significant moments and people, the Vietnam and Korean Wars, to Brooke, nurses, the Australian Light Horse, the Boer War, Navy, Army, Air Force, peacekeepers. Across then to Lake Burley Griffin, our first parliament, now the Museum for Australian Democracy, and rising behind it, our parliament, at its pinnacle, the Australian flag. The symbolism is deliberate, compelling us to remember who we are, and what we hold dear, and who paid for it. From the parliament, our political leadership has a direct line of sight to the Australian War Memorial. Some decisions, we are reminded, come at a very heavy cost. The Australian War Memorial honours those who underwrite our freedoms. The most sacred place within it is the Hall of Memory. Beneath its Byzantine-inspired dome lies the unknown Australian soldier. We don't know who he is. He's definitely not a general or an admiral. He's certainly of the lower ranks, a private, a corporal, a sergeant, a sapper, a junior officer. He could be an Aboriginal Australian. We don't know, and we never will. But we are Australians. We revere the idealism and the heroism of the everyday Australian, upon whose shoulders ultimately rests the protection of everything that we hold dear. A confluence of three issues. The long overdue repatriation of Aboriginal remains to Australia from mainly British institutions and museums, and what to do with them. The calls for the recognition of violence perpetrated against Aboriginal people in the dispossession and colonisation of Australia. And a growing controversy around Australia Day being the 26th of January. Aboriginal people recognised they needed a presence here. 50 years ago, next month, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy was established on the grounds in front of the first parliament. It seeks to visibly focus the nation's leadership on injustices endured by Indigenous Australians. It is now time for Indigenous presence here to be formalised in a way that advances understanding of and respect for the first Australians. Decades of hard work seeking to repatriate the remains of Aboriginal people from mainly British institutions has finally come to fruition. Taken as trophies or objects of scientific and cultural curiosity, Aboriginal remains stored in vaults in museums are slowly being returned. Where the origin of those remains is known, they are quite rightly returned to their traditional lands. But in many cases, ancestral origin is unknown. Remains already returned are stored in multiple places, void of the dignity that they deserve. They're owed better than this. The area just up from Lake Burley Griffin is known as Reconciliation Place. It lacks a presence commanding the respect its purpose deserves obscured in the vista from both Parliament House and the War Memorial. It could be redeveloped as a dignified precinct, honouring Aboriginal custodianship, culture and history. At its centre would be an ossuary of major proportions. Into it would be solemnly interred the remains of Aboriginal people repatriated to Australia centuries after they were taken. The symbolism would be powerful. At one end of Anzac Parade is the unknown Australian soldier. At the other end, before our parliament, would effectively be the tomb of the unknown custodians, a resting place. That's a matter for Indigenous people. Whatever the name, it must be on the centre axis and with a visible presence. The precinct around the tomb would be inlaid with granite, 
marble and stonework from regions right across Australia. It would tell the story of Aboriginal life, history and culture, list the tribes, nations, languages, feature curation perhaps in some of the more common Indigenous languages, and all of it, of course, curated in English. It would tell the story of Aboriginal presence from its known origins, history, culture and customs. It would mark European arrival, what occurred with contact and what followed. It would tell dispassionately of the devastating impact of European colonisation on the First Peoples and the key milestones in this journey. From the beneficent, awkward early relationship to dispossession and violence perpetrated. It might also present Indigenous war service for Australia. Significant Indigenous Australians might be profiled. The 1967 referendum, the 1992 Mabo High Court decision, the 2008 apology and other major milestones could be documented in our journey of Aboriginal reconciliation. The ossuary or tomb would periodically see the ceremonial interment of repatriated remains. It would have a presence above the ground and visibility in the vista. The entire area should have a spiritual ambience of reflection and sanctity, being the destination for pilgrims in search of knowing more of Aboriginal history and paying respect to it. A visitor welcome and interpretive centre could be established from which groups could be taken to the tomb and to the precinct. It would not impinge upon the tent embassy in any way, being distant from it, close to, or perhaps even emerging from the lake's edge. The construction of an ossuary, tomb or resting place in such a memorial precinct would complete the picture in our nation's capital. From the Australian War Memorial to the Parliament, we would look upon and be reminded of the First Peoples, their culture, sacrifices and contributions to our nationhood. It would also provide a practical yet spiritual solution to the destination for repatriated remains. Having such a place would help leverage negotiations with British and other institutions reluctant to return such remains to Australia. In the journey of reconciliation, this would be a major step, likely to be supported by the majority of Australians. Whatever the debate of constitutional recognition, we are a fair-minded, practical mob. Our reluctance to change the Constitution is exceeded only by our reluctance to read it. This proposal is one I believe that most Australians would get. When completed, the commissioning event would likely be one of the most significant, practical and symbolic acts of reconciliation this nation has seen. If such a significant site were to be so developed and curated, it would also provide a national focal point and basis for a new structure for Australia Day. That day, the 26th of January, 1788, is the most important day in the most important year in this country's history. On that day, Admiral Arthur Phillip sailed 11 small ships carrying 1,450 people into Sydney Harbour, half of them convicts. It was the event that would mark the disruptive devastation of millennia of rich Aboriginal history, custodianship and culture. But from that event and everything that would follow, the origins of the Australia that we now are and the people we have become. Australia Day on the 26th of January compels us to reflect on the impact of those events on the first Australians, but it needs structure beyond citizenship ceremonies, barbecues, sports, fireworks and parties. A major national event could be conducted at the tomb early in the day on the 26th of January. It would reflect upon millennia of rich Indigenous history, 
on the threshold of the arrival of the First Fleet. It would mark the last hours of undisturbed Aboriginal isolation, on the cusp of upheaval beyond our modern comprehension. The ceremony would evoke a commemorative event that celebrates all this continent was, those who cared for it to sustain life and a unique culture. It would also reflect on Indigenous endurance in the face of existential <coughs> adversities. It should be a major nationally televised event attended by the nation's leaders, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Its centrepiece could be the ceremonial interment of remains repatriated over the preceding year. Those events would precede a day of common celebration of who we now are, the people we've become, and restate our aspirations for a common future, a celebration of Australia and of Australians, Indigenous, non-Indigenous and immigrant Australians, all of us Australian. The Indigenous precinct and such restructuring of Australia Day would do a great deal, in my opinion, for the cohesion of our country around our National Day. What we have all achieved is simply remarkable, something of which we can and should be immensely proud, and to be so not just on the 26th of January, but every single day of the year. As Charlie Lynn knows only too well, at the end of the Kokoda Trail at Isuava stand four granite pillars. Inscribed in each is a single word, a value. Each one informs our national character. Courage, that spirit that challenges doubt, imposes will, protects integrity, advances values, and ultimately allows us to break through fear. Moral courage, physical courage. Endurance, we never give up. Sacrifice, to give of ourselves in the knowledge that a life of value is ultimately spent in the service of others. And mateship, that spirit that binds us as Australians in the face of adversity, no matter what. For almost two years, our freedoms have been curtailed, severely and necessarily so in many cases for prolonged periods on the basis of medical advice. Elected leaders have at times deferred entirely to public health officials for decision-making impacting our lives and our freedoms. Advice given in a functioning democracy should be just that, advice. To parliaments we elect men and women to apply intellectual rigour to the process of exercising judgment on our behalf. In doing so, they are charged with considering all of the economic, health, human and social consequences of decisions made that become public policy. Explaining the basis of those decisions, they are accountable to us. So too, our precious, hard-earned and defended freedoms go hand in hand with our responsibilities to one another. Guarded by the Menzies Research Centre, ours is a philosophy born of familiarity with idealism, hard work and self-sacrifice of the everyday Australian. Those men and women identified by Menzies in his 1942 Forgotten People broadcast, whom he described as the backbone of the nation. Our heroes are often people who work at very humble occupations. To the 18 organisations that went to Canberra in October 1944 to found what would be the Liberal Party of Australia, Sir Robert Menzies furthered the vision to which we must remain true. What we must look for, he said, is a true revival of liberal thought, one which will work for social justice and security. True liberals have great and imperative obligations to the weak, the sick and the unfortunate. To every good citizen, the state would owe not only a chance in life, but a self-respecting life. That other towering giant of our movement, a mentor 
of John Howard, Sir John Carrick, in his 1967 quarterly essay, said the true liberal is always concerned for the welfare of the individual, for the creation of the opportunities for the preservation of human dignity and the development of human personality. Finally, to young people, some gratuitous advice. Never stop believing that you can make a difference. One person believing he or she can is the only thing that ever has. As Neville Bonner, 50 years ago this year, sent to Canberra as the first Aboriginal person to ever do so by the Liberal Party of Queensland, and John Howard, different men, vastly different lives, but both of them have shown you turn setback, failure and pain into new goals and determination to achieve them. Keep an open mind. Be open to new ideas and people that are different. We all have our own inherent biases and prejudices. We tend to think we're right about everything, but we aren't. The age of social media and algorithms reinforces your own prejudices in everything from politics to culture. It threatens you fulfilling your own potential. Those who close their mind set themselves up for failure. Foremost of the threats to our liberal values is intolerance. To listen to and respect the legitimacy of another person's point of view is surely the key hallmark of a liberal. Finding solutions to what seem to be intractable problems is far more difficult and noble a task than ideological posturing and personal invective. The great 17th century Prussian philosopher Immanuel Kant said every human being is an end unto himself and not a means to be used by others. Respect for your own humanity will be found in respect for the humanity of others and morality is freedom. Nurture and protect the inner integrity of your intellect, your ability to think, articulate ideas, to challenge and change the attitudes of others is critically important. John Howard, I observed in the privileged time I had to work with him, was always reading, not just newspapers or cabinet submissions or polls, but reading books biographies, things that had seemingly not much to do with the day-to-day -day pressures of being Prime Minister, but that he did. What you need to do is to be interested in the world and make yourself interesting to it. Build and develop your character. Derives from the Greek word, it means the impression left in wax by a stone seal ring. The Greeks called it the stamp of personality. It transcends everything, rank, power, money, influence, looks, intellect, talent. And it's informed by worthwhile intrinsic virtues, values. Embrace values for the world you want, not the one you think you're going to get. And you need look no further than those four enshrined in granite at the end of the Kokoda Trail. Imbue yourself with the imaginative capacity to see the world through the eyes of others. Understanding how people think is actually more important than knowing what they think. In the end, we're all remembered not for what we are, but who we are and the humanity that we show to others. In our parliamentary ranks, we need those who are skilled in the science of politics. But the overwhelming, aching need of the nation is for men and women of conviction, shaped by and bearing layers of life experience. When a preponderance of those representing us regard their profession as little more than a game of snakes and ladders, respect for our precious democracy is diminished, as are we all. None more so than those whose blood was shed and those who have worn it. Alexander Henry White, Vivian Bullwinkle, Ken Gant, Long Tan, 
Kevin Hornibrook, Scott Palmer, are among the 102,800 Australians whose sacrifice is honoured best by the way we live our lives and shape our nation. For we are one and we are free, lest we ever forget. Thank you. Well, Brendan, um, thank you for such a thoughtful, heartfelt, analytical and, spe and a speech full of conviction. Um, I think you set an example tonight in the way in which you delivered from the heart as well as from the mind your thoughts on the Australian character and the Australian experience. Can I take the opportunity of paying tribute to you for the varied service you've given to our country? Through your chosen profession, you began as a healer of the sick and as a carer of people who needed medical attention. And you rose um, to the organisational pinnacle of that profession as president of the Australian Medical Association. You then turned your sights to politics and uh, became the, the federal member for Bradfield. It's a remarkable seat, Bradfield. It's the only seat that was that I'm aware of that um, uh, husbanded both the leader of the Australian Labor Party in an earlier iteration, Billy Hughes, and also the leader of the Federal Parliamentary Liberal Party in Brendan Nelson. Billy Hughes, of course, was a remarkable politician. He started off representing the district of Balmain in the Federal Parliament for the Labor Party. And he ended up representing Bradfield, which was the safest Liberal seat in Australia. <laughs> and as Eddie Ward, or not Eddie Ward, Fred Daly reminded a lot of us on one occasion, he said to him, Hey, Billy, you belong to every party except the country party. And he said, brother, you've got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> now, I've told that in the presence of some of my country party friends, and I've been allowed to get away with it. So I, I, I thought I would remind you of the not. But I remember Brendan best in a day-to-day -day sense from the remarkable work he did as a minister in my government. He was originally a parliamentary secretary and then after the, an election, uh, I appointed him as the Minister for Education. He did wonders with getting reforms to our university system. We didn't have the numbers in the Senate then, it was before 2004, and we had to negotiate and he was able to do that. He was able to win the trust not only of the minor parties in the Senate, and that's no mean feat, I can tell you, I still remember that. And he also won a lot of respect from people in the Labor Party. And then he became a very dedicated defence minister. And it's never easy being defence minister in any country, and it's never easy in Australia. And he had to deal with the difficulties of uh, of the various military engagements in which we were still involved. And uh, then, of course, after um, we went into opposition, he became the opposition leader. And in many ways, one of the most thankless tasks in politics is to be the opposition leader immediately after you've lost government. Because uh, people sort of don't, you know, they, they, they don't think you're going to sort of be able to get them back into government quickly. And I remember um, we had a by-election, I think in the seat of Gippsland. And it was only six or nine months into um, Brendan's um, leadership of the opposition. It was a National Party seat, the seat that Peter McGoran used to hold. And Darren Chester, I think, was the National Party candidate. He's still the member. And I was in London at the time, and um, when I heard the figures, 
I think Brian Lochnane is here tonight, rang me through the figures and I said, they're pretty good. I said, they're even, they're, they're, they're as good as the uh, results um, we, we got in the, I think the Parramatta by-election six or nine months after Gough Whitlam had been elected in 1972. And I said, look what happened after that. So, you know, I, I, I was sort of making the best of, but I think legitimately a quite remarkable result. Anyway, in the nature of things, um, the leadership of the opposition changed. I'm sort of conscious of that process. It can happen uh, on many occasions. But um, at Brendan then, of course, went off and was appointed uh, as our plenipotentiary in Brussels. And then later, of course, uh, he became the director of the War Memorial. And it is clear whenever you hear Brendan talk about that, uh, how much he embraced uh, uh, not only the history, the symbolism, uh, but particularly the spirituality of that particular task. And now, of course, he's um, running Boeing's operations uh, in Australia and doing many other good things. So it's a pretty remarkable career. Um, the last time I spent a, a, a bit of time with Brendan was just on two years ago. We were um, guests on a wonderful visit to Israel and uh, were able to um, take part in the commemoration of the charge of the light horse at Beersheba. And we spent a lot of time ruminating about past and current events and of course talking about the ongoing challenge of the politics of the Middle East but uh, at all times uh, admiring the extraordinary survival of the Jewish people and the wonderful uh, symbolism of that su survival uh, represented by the State of Israel. So Brendan, um, you've made an enormous contribution to our nation and uh, I'm touched that you were willing to deliver uh, such a thoughtful and wide-ranging address tonight. I guess the only other thing I want to say apart from wishing everybody Merry Christmas is to thank uh, Nick Cater uh, as the director of the Menzies Research Centre and all the directors of the Research Centre, keeping alive the flame of Menzies um, is a very important thing. About the most important thing I do in public life now, apart from occasionally helping the Liberal Party when I'm asked to, um, is to be the chairman of the Ramsey Centre for Western Civilisation. And I'm very pleased to do that because this organisation, the Ramsey Centre, was established through a bequest of the late Paul Ramsey, a remarkable philanthropist, a wonderful Australian, an inspired businessman, um, um, a, a dedicated servant of the Catholic Church, and in every way uh, a remarkable individual. And what he wanted done with this money was to make certain that Australians, in a holistic academic way, were reminded of the debt we owe to our Western civilization, the beginnings of Rome and Greece, the importance of the Enlightenment, of the Renaissance, the impact of the Judeo-Christian ethic on the moulding of our character. In other words, to remind us in an organised way of who we are and where we came from. Because you can't really understand who we are without knowing where we came from. And one of the things that still amazes me is the ignorance of so many Australians about the Australian firsts. How many young Australians, indeed middle-aged and older Australians, uh, really know that the secret ballot was devised in Australia? We were the first country to have it. How many Australians really know in the age of focus on the equality of women in our community, that women had the full franchise in this country, way ahead of other countries. And it wasn't until 1930 that in the United Kingdom women had exactly the same voting rights as men. And it wasn't, of course, in the United States until much, much later because of the, the segregation laws of many of the southern states that... Um, uh, both black men and black women were denied the full franchise. So 
There are a lot of things about our history that we should blow the trumpet about. There are things that we should be ashamed of. There are blemishes. We know them. We're reminded of them, and properly so. But we should remind ourselves also of the Australian firsts. And one of the things that Ramsey Centre is trying to do in its, in its way is to that. But tonight is to thank you, Brendan, very warmly. To thank all of those who worked for the Menzies Research Centre and uh, above all to remember the debt that all of us as Liberals or Liberal supporters or fellow travellers or sometimes Liberal supporters, whatever, it's a very broad church if I can borrow <laughs> a phrase. We, 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 we embrace everybody. Uh, uh, as long as they vote for us at <laughs> the right time. But to you, Brennan, and uh, lovely to see your charming wife, Gillian, uh, accompanying you here tonight. Thank you very much for such a committed exposition of the feeling you have for our country. Thank you. Finally, uh, it just remains for me to thank everybody here uh, for what I think is, is uh, a record attendance for a John Howard lecture and given that we were forced to hold it so close to Christmas, I think that's a tribute to your support but also to the... What's the score? <laughs> the score. Um, he would. He would. One for 103. <laughs> One for 103. There we go. Thank you. That speech, by the way, it, it, it is more uh, than a speech. It is more than a John Howard lecture. It is uh, a chapter, the final chapter in a book that uh, Tim James and David First Roberts are co-editing at the moment. It'll be a book of Brendan Nelson's speeches throughout his career that we'll be publishing next year. I'm looking forward very much to that. We've heard from a great orator today. So thank you, Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Howard. And uh, we'll see you again next year for the 10th John Howard Lecture. Thank you.